Gentlemen, warm welcome from Berlin, Germany. And my name is Daniel Stecher, Vice President Allen Operations, IBS Software. And on behalf of Claire Tate and the entire Airline Enigma Group, I very happy to have you with us with our first guest speaker presentation of the year. Uh, so my friend Dennis and I, we were meeting around about 2013. And uh, since that time, we kept contact, of course, and I think Dennis is a great addition to our airline crewing Enigma community, and he's going to talk today about his experience in airline operations after working many years with Cathay Pacific. We also want to take the opportunity that all new members of the airline crewing Enigma community shall introduce themselves at the end of the session so that we are also fostering networking and um, the community spirit. So I wish us fantastic 45 to 60 minutes. And um, I think, Dennis, you prefer to have the questions at the end of the session, or do you want to have them already during the presentations? Uh, what's your normal practice? I mean, I, I could do it either way. Nothing uh, is normal here, so you decide. Um, okay, on the other hand, right. of course, the, the audience doesn't know which slide to expect, maybe three slides yep. later. So maybe we keep the questions at the end. But on the other hand, if people cannot stop their eagerness to ask questions, we will also not stop them. OK. OK. All right. So stage is yours. OK. All right. Here we go again. Uh... You can see my slide, correct? Yes, we can. OK, so actually I've got um, three topics to discuss today. And as Daniel mentioned earlier on, I uh, my my previous role was in uh, operations control. So uh, crewing, as you know, is part of, you know, airline operations. Um, but my background was mainly on the operations control part, the OCC part. So crewing um, wasn't really my sort of, um, you know, strong area. But nonetheless, um, in my 20 plus years of, you know, working in the airlines, um, I had to be dealing with, you know, crew issues sort of, you know, on a daily basis. So I thought uh, rather than just talking about OCC, um, I had to, you know, mention something about crewing. And the first topic I'm going to talk about is how crew rostering uh, actually impacts uh, airline operation. Part two, uh, I'm going to talk about artificial intelligence versus human intelligence. In fact, just uh, earlier in the day, uh, you know, I was sort of reading my LinkedIn uh, messages and there was a, an interesting sort of discussion on that. So I'll, I'll elaborate when I get to topic number two. Number three, I'll mention the future of uh, OCC setup. Um, all the three topics I'm going to talk about are based on my own sort of very experience. And um, rather than sort of sharing what I know or, or what my views are, I actually want to, through this forum, uh, bring up sort of some some sort of interesting discussions. You know, what other people in the group think about it? Because uh, you know th there are always you know two sides of to uh, two sides of a story. So um, it's not for me to say, yep, you know, I support this or I don't support that. But more, I'd like to generate more sort of discussions. Uh, what we should be actually doing. So then, yeah, lastly, we'll, we'll, you know, go through the, the uh, discussions and if you have any questions about um, what I'm going to talk about today. So crew rostering impact to operations, and that's purely from someone who worked in the OCC for many years, how, um, what, what people in the crewing world do can impact how the airline runs on the day of ops. So I'll give you a bit of a, a background. Um, and this is my you know, personal experience. Um, 
the airline, you know, a number of years ago, spent a, a, a lot of money, in fact, um, on a new sort of crewing system, crew pairing system. Um, and the reason why they did that was, well, not because they they well, wanted to spend the money, um, but because I think the airline got to a point where they could not improve pilot productivity, uh, you know, using the existing sort of half, you know, automation, half sort of manual um, way of, of way of producing crew rosters. And when you spend that sort of money, obviously you want to, you know, save money as well. So um, everybody talks about return on investment. Um, so the the background was yeah. So spend a big lump sum on this new system, and another driver behind was to also try to solve the. Uh, shortage of of pilots because uh you know a few years ago that was before COVID. i mean the airline was running into a pilot shortage issue based on the up the upcoming growth and obviously COVID just reset everything you know for everyone so what was interesting about this system was um and, and i guess with any systems uh rules are put in by humans so it was actually, uh, you know, quite interesting to see um, the the driving rules um, into the system, and then the sort of interesting results that came out of it. Um, obviously, you know, some of the basic rules would be, you know, you got to you got to meet all your legal requirements. Um, but another driving factor, another what I thought was a very strong driving factor was how the airline could also save costs um, producing these different patterns. And as we all know, um, the human touch, uh, you, you can't write that into the program. So when we saw the outcomes, um, we would sort of think, well, how, how would pilots actually managed to do these patterns because they just didn't seem to be humane if you like um, and when the pilots you know rang up to complain um, often the crewing people would say well it's legal and then you know they can't they can't do it they can't say anything about it you know other than well swearing at the crew controller so um, so quite interesting what um, what the system actually did was it generated a lot of non-traditional pairings. So this airline was a, a hub and spoke airline. Um, and normally when you do a trip out and back, um, the crew would be, yeah, they would fly the aircraft out, fly back, and then they go home after the round trips. But this system actually generated a lot of what we call transit pairings. So let's say your home port, um, you know, being place A, normally you would see crew doing A, B, A, and that's the end of, you know, the duty. What we saw was there were a lot more sort of B, A, C or you know, E, A, B sort of pairings. And um, and for a lot of pilots, obviously, when they trans when they were transiting their home ports, um, sometimes they just didn't want to continue because they wanted to go home. So then they reported sick during the middle of the trip and caused a lot of disruptions to to the operation. Uh, another interesting i guess feature that we saw was um as you know people in the crewing world would know um you've got a constant schedule and you should always have sort of constant crew pairings so you can't have say you know on monday this flight comes in and then the crew would do that flight and then on tuesdays 
uh, it would come in the same flight, but do a completely different flight because that that messes people in OCC up a lot because they can't, you know, if if if, if, if they can't um, if they don't know sort of the routines, it makes their work a lot more complicated. But that's what the system actually did. And when we were having disruptions, um, the ops controllers would have to check pretty much every single flight, what the crew were doing the next duty, and it added a lot more time, obviously, and a lot more work um, to dealing with problems. So, yeah, so I just mentioned that first point, uh, second point, and also a lot of the, a lot of these pairings um, and I'll show you an example on the next slide um, with a Gantt chart. I, ops people can't really, you know, illustrate things without Gantt chart, so I'll make it uh, easier um, in the next slide. We were seeing a lot of crew sort of, you know, they would start their day uh, or they would start their duty um, about sort of mid-afternoon, the local local time, and then they would get home or, or they would transit at the home port about the evening time and they were then rostered to operate um, so-called red-eye flights uh, across Asia. So a lot of the crew, um, when they got back to the home base about 10, 11 p.m., um, they just said they were too fatigued to continue uh, to operate their next flight, the, the red-eye flight, and it, it naturally triggered a lot of issues, a lot of delays, and a lot of um, standby crew usage during that time of the day. And when you sort of, you know, when, when this when this kept happening, you would be burning off a lot of your reserve crew. So as the days went on, um, you would eventually run out of of standby pilots because you ex you know exhausted your um, your reserve coverage. So what then the OCC actually did, um, which I thought, I mean, we were trying to help at the time, but it was probably, you know, you, we, you weren't sort of solving the, the root causes. You were just putting band-aids on the problem, was to actually do a lot of preemptive roster changes on the day to avoid flight delays and cancellations. So say, for example, if we, we saw these these patterns and then we were ex, ex, sort of expecting that um, there might be delays at the home port because of you know bad weather or or other issues and the, you know the pilots during their their uh, transit um, they didn't really want to continue and then we, we, we wanted to sort of stop them from saying that they were fatigued and and report, you know, report sick for, for the subsequent flights, uh, we would do a lot of preemptive changes to the roster just to avoid the potential delays. And that to me was definitely counterproductive. Um, second, second solution. So sometimes we would do, you know, aircraft switches um, to another fleet type just to break these pairings to avoid so-called, you know, such fatigue issues or, or, you know, crew just not willing to to continue. And obviously, um, you know, because of this high sickness rates, um, crew crew control would place a lot more standby crew for these red eye flights. So this is, um, yeah, an airline uh, op control system Gantt chart and um, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with how it works, but uh, basically from left to right, the typical day of uh, flight schedule for an airline. So I've just put up um, three aircraft there. Um, first one, so starting, the, the, the day starts with the aircraft, you know, being under maintenance. 
and then it would operate this trip, Hong Kong to Bangkok, back to Hong Kong, and then another flight to Narita. Second aircraft, AAB, will operate Hong Kong to Singapore, back to Hong Kong, and then Hong Kong, Osaka later in the day. And the third aircraft, AAC, is only scheduled to operate a Hong Kong Bali uh, return service, and then it's uh, there at the home port for maintenance. So you see the red arrows, that these were the traditional crew pairings, which um, you know makes sense for crewing for for ops people. Um, you go with the aircraft, and then the crew come back later in the night and they just go home. But what this solution did or started generating a few years ago was something like this. So the aircraft schedule um, is the same, but what you see uh, differently for the crew, so for the first aircraft AAA, the crew would actually start operating this flight 006 Bangkok, Hong Kong. And then when they transit the home port, they would then operate this flight 009 to Osaka. And the same for the Singapore flight 004 comes back and then they go to operate 007. Now that's only the, the pilot movements. Um, at that time, they hadn't done anything for the cabin crew, and I believe also for the cabin crew, they had their own rules um, and and the labor laws also, or they hadn't actually cleared the, the well, not the labor law, but the um, agreements between the company and the cabin crew union, so they couldn't do anything for the cabin crew. So the cabin crew, they were actually doing the traditional um, pairings. Uh, which is, you know, Hong Kong, Bangkok, Hong Kong, Hong Kong, Singapore, Hong Kong. That, I know in, in many other airlines in the world, you know, the pilots and the cabin crew, they operate, you know, different rosters. Um, you may even have all the crew on one flight um, doing totally different pairings. And it works for them. I mean, there's, there's no problem uh, with that sort of setup. The only problem is for this particular, I guess, hub airline, um, when you experience a disruption, it becomes a far more complicated situation to resolve. And obviously this airline, you know, doesn't just have three aircraft, um, you know, had at that time close to about 200 aircraft. So you could imagine, you know, a bunch of these um, crew pairings would just throw a lot of um, issues into your into your daily operation. So the next slide, let's say just um, as an example. So if this tail AAA, um, which is having maintenance in a, uh, in the early part of the day has to have the repair work extended, then right now I'm missing an aircraft to operate this flight, Bangkok, uh, Hong Kong, Bangkok, Hong Kong. And in the past, you know, one very sort of simple solution from the OCC would be uh, if I can't find uh, uh, another suitable tail, I would just swap the aircraft. So in this case, I moved the flights from an A330 to a 777, and I would just change the pilots, uh, call them out from standby. Um, I could use the same cabin crew, maybe I'll need uh, a few more because it's a bigger aircraft. And that's my solution for this problem. So very, very simple. But with that, uh, the new pairing this is a a very interesting problem so 
I still don't have another 330 to to utilize. Um, I got to you know switch the the servers to a 777. Uh, I still have to call out the 777 pilots to do the flights. But at the same time, what I have to do, okay, is to keep the original A330 pilots um, on the flights. Now, what happens is the if I go back to this slide, so you may wonder, well, how do the crew 006 actually get to get to Bangkok? So some some of the um, the, the the rosters would be that they travel or they operated they operate to Bangkok on the 005 the day before. So they do the one flight and then they stay there for the for the de for the day. And they carry on this, you know, 006, 009 um, pairing. So in this case, the pilots that were scheduled to do 005, they still have to travel to Bangkok um, as, as deadheading or, or duty travel, because if they don't do it, there won't be any crew to operate the 006 the following day. Meanwhile, the pilots, the A330 pilots who are already in Bangkok because, because they got there the day before, they have to come back deadheading on 006 in order to operate 009. So you can see this, this new sort of pairings actually upset the operation in the ways that when when the crewing people generated these um you know the these 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 different um rosters it, it it was something they hadn't actually thought about perhaps when they were generating the rosters and they did you know they put in all the requirements you know saving costs and all that um there were a lot of savings to be had but on the day of operation, when we experience different issues uh, with the schedule, all these other problems just unfold. And it was something that they had never sort of thought about before. So I guess my, my experience, um, it, it's absolutely just for sharing, but I think my recommendation or recommendations for you know other airlines is you know we we often say in the airline world you know we work in silos and we don't talk to you know other departments and i actually think you know through this this um experience that i had feedback and continuous feedback from the occ to the crewing uh to, to the crew rostering and the schedule planning people uh, is actually very, very critical to the successful delivery of the schedule on the day. I know, you know, OCC comes under operation and then, you know, crew rostering, schedule planning. Um, in some airlines, they're under commercial. So the, the, you know, operation world and the commercial world don't actually talk to each other. But it is extremely important because it doesn't matter how great you plan it um, if some of the considerations um, are not sort of or some of these factors are not put in um, then on the day it just completely falls apart and i know that in some airlines um, they actually have people from the occ participate in the crew rostering and the schedule planning processes. I know it may be a bit a, a bit strange, but uh, it it's actually proven quite successful. And I remember a few years ago when I visited, you know, one of our partner airlines, uh, their duty manager actually mentioned before the start of their uh, seasonal schedule, the schedule planning department would actually give the draft to the OCC uh, to make comments. And I think that was that, that was great because um, 
you know, the OCC people would then say, ah, um, you know, based on past experience, normally, you know, this and that would, would sort of fail or they would see a lot of potential failure points. And then the schedule planning people could, you know, review it again before it actually um, uh, went out to the public um, or, 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 you know, go into the uh, GDS system. So last point, yep, um, mentioned earlier on, uh, breaking the silo, it's important, having regular communication between, you know, the ops world and the commercial world uh, inside an airline. Dennis, I have a question on that. Yes, go ahead. Um, was there somehow a lessons learned after a period of time? Let's say you experienced this kind of operational constraints and hassle three months, six months, and then was the airline somehow adjusting the pairing construction or was it made in stone and you had to cope with all these untraditional pairings for a long period of time? Um, we gave a lot of feedback to the crewing, crewing world, um, but unfortunately, I think at the time it was, it, you know, the company spent a lot of money on it and the mindset was, well, it's, 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 put it this way, you know, the, the sort of justification of of spending that sort of money on the system. So a lot of people naturally defended that, well, these pairings were um, more productive than before and they were saving more money than before. And But that was only just, you know, what was calculated on paper. Now, um, and a lot of them would sort of argue, well, how often would the crew report fatigue? And they would then, you know, throw sort of, you know, numbers back. Well, out of a hundred flights, you know, you might only get say three or four. Um, well, actual numbers were higher, but they would sort of argue, well, this is this is the way to go. And very often we were sort of accused of not embracing new ideas. Understood. So. Understood. What COVID did, I guess, um, it it reset everything because, as far as I know, this airline's not doing it right now, um, simply because, you know, they're they're not back to full schedule yet, but um, the system is still in place and they're still running it, so I'm sure, you know, it will go back to this sort of um, crew rostering patterns, um, but whether. You know, when they next time when they do, when they start doing that, um, will there be any improvements? I, I'm not too sure. And have you quantified the additional, let's say, costs for this dead heading or aircraft swapping and so on, or was this not? Um... Crewing, I think the crewing, um, the crew control people would have actually um, locked down the number of, uh, you know, well, not not so much roster changes, or maybe they did the roster changes. But also, I guess the use, the, the additional use of standby crew, the number of, you know, sickness, uh, especially during these patterns. So, how you financially quantify it, um, I'm not sure, and I don't actually know whether you could actually, you know, put a dollar value on that or not. Yeah. Andy, you raised your hand. Yeah, hi Daniel. Hi, uh, Dennis. Um, I, I don't work for BA anymore. I work for AG Cargo now, but I was um, in BA's control centre as a crew controller and then a um, uh, an ops studio manager for many, many years. And everything you talked about, I recognise. Um, <laughs> can, can we mention what system we're talking about here that was optimising the rosters? Is, is this the common system that you're talking about? So I say again, the the what the, the system that was optimizing your crew rosters that was giving you these pairings um, yep. was it the Carmen system? Uh, no, 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 no. Um, it was a, a big 
big company. Okay, well, I think it's Dominus. Dominus. Okay, well, uh, uh, Dennis wants to avoid the Hopefully there's no one from Jepson on this call that would, uh, if he were calling them a small company. But uh, uh, we, we had very similar problems with um, mixed schedules for flight and cabin crew, um, various equipment changes built in, bed heading, everything you spoke about. Um, yep. And our crew, the crew controllers are actually part of the OCC in, in British Airways. And we were constantly feeding back to scheduling about these issues. Um, and we did get some things changed. A good example would be Berlin, actually, because we I remember we used to have a slip. Berlin's got a very stingent night jet ban. Um, uh, you know, we don't want to keep Daniel awake at night. So um, if we if we don't get in by, um, I think, I believe it's midnight local, um, you don't get to land. And we used to have a lot of crew uh, problems with the way they, they, from the inbound journeys they had, both cabin and flight. So we, we, we actually stipulated to them that um, this is just driving a, a very late cancellation um, regularly so we don't want um the late berlin having um any any tight connections or connections at all um and and we had to feed that back i mean that they were part of operations or part of uh, flight operations our, our, our pilot schedulers they, they, they moved around they were never part of commercial but um certain things where we can demonstrate that that this is a regular occurrence that's impacting our customers and our schedule um, we, we were able to stipulate those sort of things we don't want, but we, we had some horrendous patterns that were, um, and I worked in cruise scheduling previously, so I understood that, you know, this is, you know, on paper, this is optimization, but uh, airports run on tarmacs and uh, not on paper, and, uh, and and they just didn't work very often, I, I, I found. Well, no, that's not true. They did work most of the time. But as soon as you have disruption, they were a nightmare because they were so complicated. So, you know, they were building in, in complicity to make it optimised. So, but that's how we dealt with those problems anyway, was there were certain things we could just say, here's the evidence. Um, we, we don't want those sort of patterns. Or bit. And, and they normally then next time you'd get next season will come along and then they, you'd find there would be another one or another one. And we'd have to get it broken pretty quickly um, because we it, it just constantly causes uh, problems with our, for our customers and our schedule. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think we we also had a, um, well, not, not, so much, not so much a crewing issue, but a um, number of years ago, uh, we launched uh, direct flights to Seattle, but it would get in quite late. Um, and Seattle, I believe they've got a cust a CIQ curfew. So on a number of nights, um, the flight, because the flight would, would leave, you know, Hong Kong uh, about just, just after midnight or before midnight. And that that was our peak departure time. So this flight some uh, would quite often um, get pushback delays and then miss the um, the Seattle CIQ curfew on a number of nights. Um, we had to night stop the the aircraft in Hong Kong because it just wouldn't get there in time. So after that, uh, and and that was something that I, I hadn't seen from my scheduling yep. people before. Uh, they adjusted the, the departure time by half an hour. But that, that, that's a, that's yeah. a flight scheduling issue rather than a crew scheduling issue. Correct. Right? Because you, 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 yeah. you wouldn't be having your crew operating multiple sectors before they operate yeah. in Hong Kong, Seattle, I assume. But, right. uh, but, but what I'm trying to say is sometimes you've got to make some really big mistakes um, to actually make any any real changes. And this was, you know, because we had yeah a few nights, well, when every night you had 300 people you know, staying, well, having to go to a hotel, um, the amount of customer complaints actually drove the change. Yeah. That's, that's my point, yeah. Claire, you yeah, so It feels like there should be buffers built into all these pairings, whether it's aircraft schedules or crew schedules to me, to allow yeah. uh, allow things to, to slip slightly. And of course, you build too many buffers in, then the optimization people will be turning around saying, oh, we're not optimizing it anymore. But Correct. Uh, anyway, I'll, I'll shut up now. I'll let Claire have uh, her say. <laughs> Claire, 
Oh, I I was going to say something kind of similar that it seems like with an this is common across many airlines like my previous employer and, and one of the things with optimization is that the optimizer will do anything unless you tell it not to and unless you tell it <laughs> it's true um or unless you tell it what you're willing to trade off so if you say you know build in a new parameter that says i like this thing but i don't like this thing um unless it's going to save me x y and z so i think the the really interesting thing is is the trade-offs and that makes it more difficult because i think we we make a lot of trade-offs in our minds that we don't necessarily put on paper or quantify and so when you get into optimization or the next topic you're going to go into artificial intelligence um, you have to be really clear about what the trade-offs are and what the priorities are because if the priority is for example pilot staffing you don't have enough pilots to staff the schedule then the airline has to decide am i willing to cut the flight schedule or am i willing to introduce some operational risk um, and then you have to really understand what that costs so i'm interested to see um, the rest of your presentation if you are getting into that kind of topic okay um, what I'll do now is I'll move on to the next topic. Okay, so AI versus uh, HI. Um, I think that's one question. Well, who should be leading inside uh, the OCC? Again, I'll start with a uh, again chart. Um, this is a typical domestic airline schedule um, for uh, for an airline in Australia. So again, I've picked two aircraft. Um, they both start in Sydney and they're rostered to do, you know, multiple flights and they both end up back in Sydney for uh, overnight maintenance. So I'm going to you know, uh, throw in a problem here. So what, what will the ops controller do? Um, this red line here is the current time uh, and it indicates where the aircraft are at the moment. So the first aircraft, CAA, um, right now it's on the ground in Melbourne, scheduled to operate 010. And the next aircraft, CAB, uh, it's en route, flying Zero, uh, 201 from uh, Sydney to Adelaide. So right now this, you know, we're having really bad weather weather in Melbourne, uh, which is actually the forecast uh, for the day or throughout the day. So what would the, uh, or what would the ops controller do uh, to solve this issue? And you can see uh, for the first day, the first tail, you know, flight 10 and flight 25 overlap. So there'll be knock on effects for the rest of the day. And uh, many of you may know Sydney actually has a curfew starting at 13.00 UTC. So it doesn't actually have a lot of buffer left. So I've listed all the solutions here or well. Actually, there, there would be many more solutions, but the four that I can think of um, number one. I would cancel flight 5362. So if I go back one slide, okay, it's the last two sectors on this aircraft. So I would cancel that um, because it's a lot later in the day. And in fact, these flights, you know, are scheduled in the evening. So right now it's, you know, early morning time. Um, I have the whole day to tell you know reservations to contact the affected customers and put them on other other flights and because i know this aircraft is scheduled to go through melbourne you know a number of times during the day so i know the subsequent uh flight schedule would be delayed so this is 
one of the solutions and it's probably my most preferred solution because it will have the least amount of impact to the schedule, um, to the crew, uh, and most importantly, to the guests of the, of the airline. Solution number two, cancel 4653. So rather than the last two sectors of this tail, uh, you cancel the second and the third last, um, which is well similar to, to option one. Uh, again, you've got plenty of time to contact the guests uh, and move them to, to other flights. The third solution, um, a little bit strange, um, you cancel zero, uh, 5160, that was originally scheduled on the second tail, and then you move the Sydney, Melbourne, Sydney service 5362 onto that tail. Um, And then the last one, um, you simply cancel the flight in front of you right now, uh, flight 10 and 25, and then move the passengers to other flights. Obviously, it's the least preferred because you've already got the crew out, um, the passengers already waiting at the gate if they're not on board already. Um, and it would be a lot, of, a lot more work actually for the ground staff to look after the, the customers. So I guess my question is, well, that well, that was the human thinking. What would a computer do to fix this problem? And my answer is, it's probably very similar to what the ops controllers come up with. Now let's look at the same GAN chart. So same 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 schedule, and this problem occurs. Um, a lot later in the day. So uh, you see the red line, it's uh, pretty much, you know, towards the end of the day. Um, there's a delay on flight 53 and uh, because of an unruly passenger. So we've got to delay the flight to offload that person um, and probably the luggage. Uh, the aircraft is going down to Melbourne and coming back to Sydney just about half an hour before curfew. So what would the ops controller do to fix this problem? And I know you're not um, ops people, but I'll give you a, maybe, you know, 10 seconds to sort of think about, well, how would you handle this situation with a flight uh, that's pushing really, really close to curfew? Okay, so I'm going to reveal my answer now. Paul, Paul raised oh. his hand. Oh, go, go on. Go on. So, sorry, I was going to say I'd ring for dispensation. See, try my <laughs> luck. Yeah, that's one one answer. Yeah. And I thought somebody else wanted to say something. Nobody okay. else. No. All right, no problem. All right. So this situation actually happened to me many many years ago um, except it wasn't an unruly passenger it was something else so and this is my my thinking process at the time well i can't really just cancel the flight because of the unruly passenger um, it would be a pr disaster because everyone else was on board and you can't just then send the aircraft, leave it in Melbourne uh, because it would have to come back, well, number one for maintenance, but also, as you know, for domestic airlines or short haul um, airlines, uh, you have to have all your aircraft in the right spots every night to start the next day's schedule. So I can't, you know, and, and with Sydney having a, a very sort of hard curfew, uh, you can't just then say, OK, well, I'll ferry the aircraft early in the morning uh, to pick up the next day's flight schedule. Uh, that that costs money, too. And 
can you and another thing as well can you find crew to actually come out to the airport three o'clock four o'clock in the morning to pick up that ferry flight so at the time my my and and it was a, a solution that sort of came out from maybe a bit of stress a bit of pressure um we or oh, you see the um the second aircraft uh it's got flight 60 operating the second last flight from melbourne so at the time what i did was i looked at the number of seats on flight 60 uh, actually had plenty of seats so i asked the melbourne ground staff okay um would we'll delay the this flight we we'll hold this flight okay for all the customers booked on flight 62 and when 53 gets to melbourne as soon as all the passengers disembark and the aircraft refueled ferry the aircraft back to sydney right away so the um at the time I was, I was working for this airline, it was a, a low cost carrier, so they would schedule just half hour um, transits. So um, if you don't do any sort of transit cleaning um, and it, it's, you know, it's just, it was a 737, uh, the refueling uh, would only take well, 10, 15 minutes. So as the passengers, you know, got off the plane, um, they could just quickly refuel and then close the doors and and get going again so that was the solution that i came up with and what i guess wanted to 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 know is well what would a computer uh or how would a computer actually respond in this case i guess the answer is well probably not the same as me So I'm not saying that, you know, I'm leaning on one side or another. I think I, I do know and, and I do appreciate that, you know, both artificial intelligence and human intelligence have their own, you know, pros and cons. And we'll start with, you know, the pros for AI. And that is uh, the decision making process is consistent whether it's you know whether you're running an operation or you're you know building crew rosters um, as long as your criteria remain the same the solutions generated are are consistent so you wouldn't have okay well uh, i guess the um the last point here is is you, you don't have human emotions affecting your decision so everything is sort of very black and white and another advantage is the computer definitely has the ability to solve some very highly complex problems in a very effective and also in a holistic way but on the condition that um the, the the circumstances remain constant and i'll explain that um you know what i mean by that so let's say you know in 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 the past in in my last job uh we would get a strong typhoon uh in the summer every now and then that would shut down the airline operation now if i know um the airline's gonna stop flying let's say for a whole day and then I got to resume uh, operation the operation the following day. Um, the computer could probably, you know, organize the flights to crew uh, based on customer demand, um, uh, you know, crew uh, crew rest, crew uh, or, you know, or the legality issues. They would probably the computer would probably do it quite quite effectively. Um, I remember, you know, when I had to do it. Uh, with a team of OCC staff, um, it would take us just hours and hours, and then we would, you know, publish the schedule, the, the new schedule, and then keep making changes um, 
because we realized later on we make mistakes uh, um, in in a new schedule that we're now and the the subsequent you know uh, adjustments of of times or or you had to cancel let's say you know the 10 o'clock flight and actually operate the 12 o'clock because because of either a, a crew rest issue or something uh, that would cause a lot of customer inconvenience and a lot of you know bad PR um, you know so it it is definitely very useful in that sense um, another thing is you know the, the computer uh, definitely won't forget certain things during stressful situations but then I guess the downside is well you have solutions that are not flexible or tailor-made. Um, the you know, airline operation is a very dynamic environment and you have to be dealing with a lot of moving pieces. So, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, rigid solutions, uh, be, because let's say, you know, you, 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 you do roster change to to some crew um you know they would argue well actually it's, it's you know you know why are you waking me up like three o'clock in the morning blah 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 computer solutions don't think about these things whereas you know the crew controller will say oh yeah actually well um your previous duty you know you only sort of came back um you're not um acclimatized yet so uh, we'll give you a bit more rest and you know give you another duty so humans would do that sort of stuff um, computers won't um, another problem is it's difficult to achieve a solution if your conditions are constantly changing so say for example in this typhoon situation um, again I've had to deal with um, diversions in the middle of a typhoon or well, not in the middle of a typhoon but more after it's gone but you still get the very strong you know tailwind uh, sorry the very strong crosswinds and wind shear um, and you start having diversions um, it's easy to sort of manage two or three but if you're having aircraft coming in and they're not uh, and they're not able to land and that when they when you start having more and more diversions how would a computer system manage the event uh, as you lose more and more resources so i don't know um i i, I mean i don't know how, how how that would work and as i mentioned before yeah rules are rules so for the computer um there's no there's, there's no, uh, I guess, argument. So it's either black or white. Um, and the lack of human touch, I think, is definitely important when you're dealing with, you know, a lot of ops problems. So say in a creeping delay, you're dealing with crew, um, whether you want the crew to exercise um, a bit of discretion to go beyond their duty time, um, it's only you know only the human in the OCC can actually uh, achieve these things Andy you raised your hand yeah um, Dennis the, the, the example you gave us though I mean that was a, a specific example affecting a couple of flights but surely in 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 big airlines where you've got mm, multiple operations impacted that's when you need the AI so that's an example at Heathrow we have two runways if we lose a runway for three hours in the middle of the afternoon we we have to take out probably 50 percent of our capacity for a period of probably four hours um mm -hmm. and get and, and 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 we're not just talking long haul flying now we're talking about multiple shorter flying with all the complexities of the aircraft uh, pairings and crew pairings that we've already discussed yep but a, a human being 
we cannot think logistically there. We, we have crew controllers, aircraft controllers, um, and and come up with optimized solutions in those in those uh, scenarios. That's where we need uh, intelligence of system that will you can give it the problems. It will have your rules in there, and yeah, there might be certain things that it. it, it a human being will go in that specific case or do something different, but that would come up with a holistic solution that is probably better than anything a human can come up with when you, you know, you can't throw a hundred problems at a human being and say solve them in 10 minutes. Not unless we all employ people who have the brain power of Stephen Hawkins, but I guess our OCC budgets will not uh, stretch that far, unfortunately, when it comes to the, the salaries. Yeah, so no. to me, to, to me, I think it's reversed to what you said. To me, it's when you have mass disruption, that's when you need AI. Uh, I could quite easily sit and look at a problem and come up with a two or three solutions and work it out. What's best for the schedule? What's best for the customer? What's best for the um, uh, crew? Um, but you give me a hundred problems, I can't do that. I agree. Yeah, and 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 I don't disagree with you. I have to say. Um, same thing, you know, when I had to deal with, you know, typhoon disruptions and the same thing, um, after it was over, um, the airport would implement um, uh, slot control. So airlines wouldn't be able to restart all your operation uh, straight away. They would gradually resume. So the airlines would be told, well, let's say for the first 12 hours, you would operate. 50% of your flights. And for us, it would be, you know, sometimes we, we just didn't have time to figure out, let's say out of 100 flights, which 50 to cancel. Um, and when we were, you know, getting quite close to the deadline to submit our re revised schedule, uh, we would just randomly pick flights that seemed easy to us. And, and I agree, AI definitely in this sense, uh, would be would be extremely useful. Um, another example that I I had um, and it was a uh, a computer well uh, a big vendor uh, trying to sell us an AI tool, and they used an example from a U.S. based airline um, that you know a number of years ago they had big snowstorm at JFK and the airline was based at JFK. So the AI system um, managed to, so they, they redid the, the flights and then they had to redo the crew rosters and the airline was using their tool for the, yeah, for the crew um, just to reorganize the crew. And what they found was, well, the AI tool uh, redid everyone's roster and in the end they only used i think about 12 standby crew now if they had done it manually uh, they probably would have used over 100 and it yeah it makes sense because a crew controller wouldn't be able to look at well maybe they had you know all the hundreds of flights that they got to recruit so ai definitely helps and i'm not saying um it it's not useful or it's not but i think there are there are situations where i'm still not sure whether ai would actually take over so not not small problems but if, i mean even some bigger problems let's say with this typhoon that that i was you know or you know i i used to be dealing with you may think, OK, well, this is the. So before, yeah, before you, you replan it or. Before the. Um, you know, replanning your flight, OK, well, this this was the criteria, OK, 50 percent of your slots, uh, you could only operate 50 50 percent of your capacity. But as. The airline or as the airport resumes. Um, and the weather situation changes, which then sort of, you know, changes your operating um, conditions. How do you then readjust to the new environment? 
So let's say the actual landing conditions or the actual winds are stronger than than forecast, and even the 50% capacity, uh, the airport just can't handle it because of a lot of you know holding, a lot of go rounds and diversions, and now you've got to further cut your your number of flights. I don't know whether at that point in time AI could actually come in and solve the problem. So I think that's the difference I want to make. Um, as I said before, you know, if if the conditions remain constant, AI, fantastic tool. But if you know other other situation changes, um, and other other factors are different to your original plan, then I don't know. I, I mean, I haven't seen how it works yet, but maybe it can. You know, one day. Maxim raised his hand. Thank you, Danny. Thank you very much for your for for sharing your you know your thoughts. You, you know, I'm, first of all, I'm happy that I'm a part of big software vendor. You are mentioning every time. So. <laughs> So, but you know, you you are talking about uh, some disadvantages of AI. But um, in my experience, it's not about AI. It's not. It's more about digitalization of all you know en environment and all media, because what wh why people still you know why why human beings still better than AI? Because we can consume plenty of additional information and understand that right now it's this like uh, strong wind is relevant for us and I could predict that half of capacity would not be you, you know provided. So that's uh, the problem with uh, you know you, you know in general. So I, I suppose that okay next years all services all information would be okay more and more digitalized so developers of this algorithm would be able to feed their systems with a more you know with, with more data and one day so i i suppose uh, we will you know like supervisor supervisors over AI, not like uh, competitors, but we will be a supervisor just, uh, you know, to um, to have 90% done by system and for 10% or you know, 5% like uh, to be a backup. So there's no, you know, pro and cons, there's no competition between between two approaches. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Dennis, do we want to continue with the presentation? Uh, yep. Yeah. Oops. So yeah, so um, human intelligence, I guess it, it's, uh, well, a lot of the points are sort of the opposite of, of uh, what I mentioned on the previous slide. And I guess the for human intelligence, you see that in the OCC, um, when you have experienced staff, um, very often, a lot of the problems uh, when you have the A team on duty, they can deal with them very, very quickly uh, without having to sort of, well, I guess, you know, look at or, or you know, look at numbers and then, you know, working out or, or, or calculate, you know, risks and, and, and probabilities. So the that's, I guess, well, but on the condition that, you know, you have, you know, some very experienced, some very smart people in the OCC. Otherwise, you know, well, new people can't, can't definitely can't do that. Um, and quite often I find that uh, with some very complicated solutions, like the one that I, I showed you earlier before, uh, very often we solve problems, these problems with, outside the box solutions and again i'm not sure whether ai can actually uh well think outside the box if you like um next point i find that humans are generally quicker or respond quicker when 
you're dealing with changing circumstances. So in my case, you know, the bad weather, the typhoon, um, you know, so let's say, uh, you know, I've already had like three diversions and I know in my mind, okay, there's 10 more flights to land. Now the fourth one's diverted. Now straight away, I'll start thinking, okay, well, for the other, the remaining flights, they're probably not going to get in. What do I do now? Can AI think in advance at that point in time? Again, I'm not too sure because I'm not, you know, not not familiar or I haven't ha haven't actually, um, you know, got involved in that sort of technology. But so I think for for humans, yeah, you 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 start thinking differently and you start thinking ahead. And that's because also, well, I've done this before, I've seen this before. If I don't do something now, or if I don't uh, proactively plan something now, then it's going to fall apart. So you have that sort of thinking um, that humans will do um, that maybe computers won't. And I talk about the 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 downsides. Obviously, it's the you know what what the that's that's the advantages for for AI um, is when you've got different duty managers, uh, you come up with different solutions. And we in my previous role, you know, we were very often seen by management of not being consistent. Um, you have you know people change. Um, uh, when you know when they finish a shift and the decision made the decisions made in the previous shift uh, could be changed when the next lot of people come in so that's well it's seen as a bad thing um, and as I mentioned earlier on when you're under high stress or high pressure uh, you are very likely to come up with less optimal solutions or decisions I mean I used to work, you know, overnight shifts and I would get so tired and when the operation got busy, sometimes it would just quickly throw a solution at the problem um, because you can't handle it. So that's the, you know, that's the downside um, of human intelligence. And I guess most importantly is, you know, if you lose the experience in the OCC, uh, which we've seen during COVID, um, you're less likely to be able to deal with the operation in an effective way, uh, in which case, you know, uh, AI would come in quite handy. So, and I think it's a, it's a, an ongoing issue. It's a worldwide issue that as, you know, um, people with experience quit or, or, you know, change jobs or leave the industry, um, it's affecting the OCC quite badly. So maybe AI does have a place in the future uh, to compensate that. Any questions? Paul, oh, yes, yeah, so, sorry, sorry, Dennis, I just one. Um, yep. I'm amazed that over the years, how departments don't talk to each other sufficiently. And usually there are people who have never experienced OCC or even crew rostering who, when there's, in my experience of OCC, when there was significant disruption, the senior management liked to drop in unannounced and come up with all of their scenarios and do this, do that, don't do this, do that instead. And I don't think that's going to fit in AI. And most times senior management like to be seen to taking charge and making those decisions <laughs> um, <clears throat> and they usually pardon me screw it as opposed to fixing it <laughs> Tell me about so it. In, in your experience uh, have you been able to overcome these challenges and is this part of the future of OCC that you would like to see eliminated um, yes it's a it's a contentious topic um i i guess what uh 
in my i guess previous role um well the the top management sort of changed uh, once every few years so um so it it really just depended on um that person at the time um some of them they knew they were not experts in airline operation uh they would come in um to show their face and then they would say well i trust that you know you'll do a good job so i'll leave you to it and they walk out so they they you know they they they, sh- they show their appearance uh you acknowledge them um and then you go back to you know dealing with the problems um and then you would get other ones where you know they would come in yeah unannounced uh and tell you to do to do this and that but eventually um you know you, you couldn't just follow every single thing that they did because um i mean i i had a case where you know we had an aog somewhere else and then uh, uh top management would come in and say oh well why don't we just ferry the aircraft there right now and and you know save uh, bring the passengers back well um you can't just operate a ferry flight uh as you may know um if it's a new flight it's not in the seasonal schedule you could apply for all these uh, additional clearances and approvals and they don't come straight away depending on which part of the world you are and uh, even you know well before the war the the ukraine um, war uh, trying to fly over russia uh, getting that approval sometimes it would take days to get a response so it's not like you just uh, yeah go and follow everything so i think yeah back to your question um no it doesn't fit in the ai but i i, I guess as far as the the relationship with management so i think they need to if if they believe well either way you know if they think well ai is the way to go then they've got to definitely show their full support and follow you know what the computer says um i actually yeah i was going to mention this this um uh example i was talking with a european airline um in my last job and they had yeah so they they developed a i guess some sort of ai tool with again a very big consulting company and they were sharing just their experience because they were also new to you know to this this um i guess ai well not i guess it's that they haven't quite reached the ai level yet but some sort of automation uh, a suite of automation tools from you know schedule planning to their occ operation and they were sharing uh, yeah their their opinions and generally they were they were positive but one thing that i picked up just from you know one of their um examples and that was i think about yeah middle of last year uh the tool that they they started using so within europe you know they operate in breas and the 737s and the system would uh, look at the schedule and look at um, opportunities to save money so by downgrading flights from 737 to an Embraer uh, which I guess well a human would would be looking at like you know if you if you if your um, control window your OCC control window is quite long then you you would be scanning you know hundreds of flights continuously to look at these you know opportunities downgrade Um, a computer could just pick that up anytime so definitely ai wins 
in that regard is you don't have to be hiring a team of people to be there 24-7 just to look at every single flight path on your GAN chart. And that's, you know, we're talking about thousands of them. And the flights get changed, you know, constantly. So you can't be just chasing after all these different movements. For their long haul flights, they fly uh, the 777 and the 787. And their feedback was uh, they didn't quite implement this tool for their long haul operation. And that that actually, I I thought it was quite interesting because if you've got, you know, for a long haul flight, if you've only got, let's say, 100 people, uh, you would definitely fly the 787 over the 777 to save a lot of fuel. But why didn't they actually uh, start using it? Now, that was middle of last year, and their response was the cargo people completely objected to the decision. Why? Because about, well, six months, nine months ago, a lot of airlines were still relying on cargo revenue to survive. So you wouldn't downgrade from a big, from a 777 to a 787 to offload all this cargo. Um, number one, uh, you already actually had all your belly space booked already. So you can't be just saving 30, 40 tons of fuel and then offload all the cargo that you've already accepted. Um, it's 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 that part where I just found very interesting how you um, how should I say it? It 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 isn't sort of um, yeah it it hasn't actually quite achieved the objective of the tool. You know, if if the goal, if you one, if the rule or one of the rules um, that you put into the system is to save money, well, how do you actually deal with, I guess, the human side of things? And I guess another example I would then use is, let's say you've got, yeah, so you're trying to save money, and then you your system would look at be constantly looking at you know downgrading flights to save fuel cost well in this i mean in this particular case you know we were just talking about cargo you know dead things but what if the computer starts picking on flights where well okay if you just downgrade a flight you'll only deny boarding let's say five people and as we all know you know every flight always has some no-shows so would an airline start doing it just again you know for the sake of fuel saving start doing this on a daily basis and start causing deny boardings every day how do you then deal with i mean you may be you know you may not be downgrading or, or deny boarding a lot of people but if every day you do it you and you upset a few people how do you I mean, it, it goes into social media very quickly. How do you deal with that? So, what's the cost of that? You know, the, the that, and then they, you know, somehow find out that what well, the airlines using this tool to save money. How do you deal with the cost of that? So, I I think that's yeah. It it was an interesting experience, you know, just just to te to to hear how other airlines do it. Dennis, looking on the clock. Oh yeah. Are, oh yeah, yeah. We are in the 80th minute already. Okay. Okay. So, shall we close now, or how many minutes you calculate for your future of OCC? Well, I'll very go through it very quickly. I think. Um, or should I maybe save it for another time? I don't know how. Maybe our... save it for another time because. The future okay. of OCC is such a big topic. OK, yep. yeah, let's save it for another time.
But uh, thank you very much. Um, I think that was a fantastic uh, presentation. Are there further questions from the audience? Maybe Alex and Kevin, do you want to introduce yourself? Because you're also new members of our community. No, they don't. OK, so then <laughs> then Kevin. let's. Ah, yeah. Kevin. Yes, uh, yeah. this is Kevin. Uh, I'm, I'm from uh, Hong, Kong, Hong Kong first. So I know Dennis quite well already. Yes, hi, Kevin. Yeah, and it's great to have uh, more on colleagues from Asia Pacific because Dennis, you're currently based in Taiwan, isn't it? That's right. Yeah. Cool. And Alex Tirko, where are you based? Hi, Daniel. I'm based in Lagos, Nigeria. Oh, oh, that's very good. So we have a global spread today. Africa, Asia, Americas, Europe. Fantastic. Good. Right. So just right. Thank you for looking. Me. Say again. I said thank you for having me. Great presentation, Dennis. Thank you. Thank you very so much. Let's look, let's look also how our community is evolving because we have meanwhile 137 international airlines. So I think also Claire's interview on CNN was driving our community. Thank you very much for that, Claire. Um, and looking ahead, what's next? So on Valentine's Day, what is better than attending an Enigma community presentation? We have Leonie Goddard uh, speaking also with her hotel business perspective um, and touching uh, interesting topics uh, in this regard. So I'm looking forward to it. And uh, yeah, then please get in touch with Claire and uh, me if you have any suggestion um, or also comment on how we are running these sessions. We want to improve um and what we are doing is for the community and also if you have any idea who should be one of the upcoming guest speakers just contact us and we will do the needful and try to convince these colleagues thank you very much again claire do you want to close and say something um no i mean i think we we have a, a reduced audience some people had to drop off but just thank you dennis i think this is uh, a topic many can relate to, and I'm excited to see sort of how the industry progresses with building more human intelligence into into computers and adding adding those things that humans consider that aren't yet programmed. So it'll be interesting to see how the tools progress. And I was just reading today that there was again a driverless car creating a huge traffic jam in California. Um, so all the um, drivers in the cars had to somehow circumvent this driverless car. So it's quite, quite still challenging that all these uh, solutions work. And I was just reading in a very interesting book that you need 15 people to operate one driverless car. That is something I was <laughs> not aware about it. So you replace one driver, but you have 15 people who have to manage this car. So this is also creating new job profiles. So let's see how the future is evolving. So thank you very much to everybody. Please stay healthy and safe and looking forward to see you soon again. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. 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 Thanks.